Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Soar Like an Eagle, the key to fast and full life cycle incident response. My name is Alex Fishletter and I'm the marketing manager here at D3 Security. We have a great presentation lineup for today, but first, let's get some housekeeping items out of the way. Number one, we're going to have an open and engaging broadcast. This means we encourage questions from the audience. To ask a question, simply type it into the chat window and we will address it and we will address it throughout the webinar. Yes, we will be giving a $100 Amazon gift card to whoever asks the most engaging question. So we look forward to that debate. Number two, we want to be respectful of everyone's time. So we have a hard stop at 11 a.m. Pacific. That's about an hour. Uh, the webinar will be 45 to 50 minutes in length, and then we'll have between 10 to 15 minutes of uh, questions. So keep your questions to the end. All attendees will also receive the webinar recording not long after it's over. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit more about our subject matter for the day, and that is security automation and response, or what we like to call SOAR. This is an incredibly hot topic among security operations and security executives. It's also a product category that has evolved significantly in the past six months. Uh, I would actually be remiss not to mention the D3 platform in this regard. In 2018, we built our first integration library, developed an incredibly flexible visual playbook editor, and extended the orchestration concept to case management, compliance, and deeper investigation. So it's a very exciting time to be in this space. Now, on that note, let me introduce our presenters for the day. And uh, today we're going to be having John um, Oltsik, who's a senior principal analyst at, at ESG, as well as our D3 director of cybersecurity, Stan Engelberg. Now, uh, just turn it over to yourselves. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. That's greatly, greatly appreciated there. Um, just to kind of start things off, uh, John, could you please give us a short bio on yourself and just uh, let us know who you are and give us some of your background, please? Sure. Um, well, welcome, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm John Oltzik, Senior Principal Analyst and ESG Fellow at ESG. Uh, I've been in the IT industry for over 30 years and have been in cybersecurity for over 15 years. I started the cybersecurity practice here at ESG in 2003. And um, now I cover all aspects of cybersecurity with a focus on CISOs and CISO risks. Uh, and decision making. Fantastic. Thanks, John. Uh, my name is Stan Engelbrecht. I'm uh, the Director of Cybersecurity Practice within uh, D3 Security. I've been in the company a number of years now, uh, focusing mainly on obviously the incident response industry, but also uh, looking at uh, case management in regards to tracking digital forensics investigations, up to uh, HR e-discovery and different things like that. But as Alex um, had mentioned at the beginning, our focus has been largely in the uh, incident response and the SOAR market. So we're really looking forward to uh, bringing, bringing that to you today. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you. So a couple of things I just want to go and address, um, address today just in regards to the webinar. Uh, we did choose SOAR like an eagle, uh, not just by chance, but also just looking at the fact that um, today's SOCs really require a lot of the same strengths that, that an Eagle has um, to do with anything, anything to do with their agility, their speed, their ability to um, take in the entire situation from a high level and then d deep dive down into, into the weeds and kind of get, their, get everything set and right and, and position themselves correctly. This type of an analogy really helps, uh, helps coordinate the team and, and really brings everything together in such a way that, that they're able to, able to really focus and work to remediate those incidences that come on and, and really look at what's critical to the overall area of the, of the situation. So rather than just kind of looking at a, on a low surface level where they're really playing whack-a-mole, uh, the ability for an incident response and case management platform to, to have um, automation orchestration uh, gives them that extra agility and that ability to just not whack a mole, but actually focus on what's what's most important. And John, I believe in the next section, you're going to go through some research um, that that you did, and just kind of give us a, a, a deeper understanding of this uh, this particular topic. Correct. 
So if we go on to the next slide, please. Um, we did some research last year. The research was um, with about 350 cybersecurity and IT professionals working at enterprise organizations, and enterprise being defined as 1,000 employees or more. And we wanted to look at uh, security operations and analytics, and we started with a basic question here. So we asked the respondents what their security operations objectives were. Now, before I go into the data itself, uh, a couple of things. One is it doesn't matter which bullet point I pick here. It's all about efficiency. It's all about improving efficiency. So that kind of tells you where we are is inefficient, that we need the next level of efficiency um, act activity to, to get there. Um, you can also think about all the, the people involved, all the tools involved, all the processes involved. To me, it sort of reminds me of, um, of Henry Ford moving from an, uh, a manual uh, assembly line to an automated assembly line. That's really where we're at, is we're trying to automate the assembly line. So if we look at the data, um, the number one response was to improve our ability to detect, contain, and remediate advanced attacks and insider attacks, so 34%. And that's fine. Um, there are, we have analytics tools that are getting better and better at pointing out problems, pointing out incidents. Um, but we have to do something with that data. So one of the main objectives was to decrease the amount of time it takes for security incident detection and remediation, which is closely related to this. So if you think about the Verizon uh, DBIR report, um, roughly 200 to 250 days to detect, and, to detect an incident and then add on to fix that incident. That's what we're after with this data. That's what companies are after. Those are their objectives moving forward. So if you go to the next slide, the question really is, OK, if those are the objectives, how are they doing? Now, before I, actually, before I move on, can you go back one? So I'm just curious, Stan, is that consistent with what you're seeing uh, from your customer base? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, this type of you know, that type of a detection phase where items are in the in the environment for months prior to being detected, and, and then having that uh, that time frame, which is taking them longer and longer to to remediate, you know, for whatever particular reason, whether it's overwhelmment or others. But that's uh, it echoes with all the clients that I've that I've spoken with so far. Right, and it really does kind of introduce the need for this SOAR category, which is relatively new, but it's an mm -hmm. acute pain point. So I'm sure you're seeing that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if we go on to the next slide, um, this is the, the downside, Stan, is that uh, we asked people to, uh, these respondents, we asked them, well, how would, you, how would you compare security analytics and operations today to how it was two years ago? And you can see by that blue piece of the pie, 27% of those we talked to said cybersecurity analytics and operations is significantly more difficult than it was two years ago. And another 45% said that cybersecurity analytics and operations is somewhat more difficult than it was two years ago. So 72% think things are more difficult today, security operations are more difficult today than they were two years ago. So if we, if we go back to the objectives that we had, you don't have to go back on the slide, but if you think of the objectives, we have these very um, aggressive objectives, yet things are getting more difficult. It's getting more difficult to achieve those uh, objectives. Is that is that what you're seeing, Stan? Yeah, it's, and you look at the, you know, you mentioned it here, like this is over the top of the last two years. If we think about corporate footprints, um, just device-wise, um, IoT, um, you know, bring your own devices. That, like it's 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 been almost an exponential growth in in terms of how difficult it is to go and protect these things. And you know, your numbers here, your numbers here are amazing because you look at it. Only six percent of companies polled even think that their security operations got easier. Um, that's that, that's not a good percentage. It, it it you know things are clearly getting far more difficult. Um, and, and just far, you know, far more complex, I would say, in, in, terms of, in terms of what they are actually trying to protect. 
Yeah, good points. And if you go on to the next slide, this data really reflects what you just talked about, Stan, and that is for those 72% who, who said things were getting more difficult, we, we asked them the obvious question of, okay, well, why do you believe that? So the top answer, 26%, said that the threat landscape is evolving and changing so rapidly it's making it difficult to keep up with trends that they need to understand for security analytics and operations. So basically, there are more types of threats. The threat actors are more sophisticated. They're using different tactics, techniques, and procedures. And if I'm heads down um, trying to remediate vulnerabilities or investigate alerts, I just don't have time to understand what's going on in the threat landscape. See, 90% said the volume of security alerts or alarms has increased. So we've got all of these red lights going on, and then to look at them, to investigate them, to prioritize them, very difficult to do, especially if the volume is growing. 18% um, said we have gaps in our security monitoring tools and processes. So it's difficult to get a true understanding of security across the entire internal and external infrastructure. Now, SOAR actually addresses this because if there are gaps between processes, how can we unify those processes with common case management and common run books and common visibility? That's really where SOAR is helping. But right now, that's a problem that's making things more difficult. And then I'll also point out one final data point here, and that's 18% say we don't always have the right skills to keep up with security analytics and operations. And this problem is more pronounced today than it was two years ago. Now, I've written quite a bit about the cybersecurity skills shortage. Uh, our research indicates that 51% of global organizations say they have a problematic shortage of cybersecurity skills. That is not going to get better anytime soon. So therefore, to improve security operations, we have to make our people, we have to help our people work smarter and not harder. And so that's part of what we're here to talk about today. Agree, Stan? Oh, absolutely. It's, that's just a running theme that we hear every single time we talk to people. Um, you know, one of the first questions we ask is, you know, how, how are you guys finding, you know, hiring people? And it's the same story over and over again. It, it's, it, it's becoming more and more difficult. Um, and, and the space is just getting bigger. It's not getting smaller. Yeah, absolutely. And if we go to the next slide, uh, Aside from the fact that things are getting more difficult because there are more alerts, because of the threat landscape, because we don't have the right skills, et cetera, these are some of the problems or the challenges that people uh, talked about when talking about security operations. Mm -hmm. So if you go back one slide, please. Um, total, nope, one, one forward. So total cost of operations came out as the number one security challenge. Now there's money in security. Budgets are growing, the overall market's growing, but the total cost of operations is a challenge because we're spending a lot of money, but we don't feel like we're getting a return on our, 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 our investments, that uh, we're not getting incremental benefits as we think we should. So in other words, we're not really addressing those efficiency problems that we talked about before. 27% um, said the cybersecurity team at my organization spends most of its time addressing high priority emergency issues and not enough time on strategy and process improvements. That scares me because it says that people are heads down, they're firefighting all the time, they're burning out, but they're not thinking ahead. They're not thinking about what the, the next thing that the cyber adversaries will attack or their next vulnerability. And they're not communicating those risks up the chain to the business people so they can get budgets and they can maybe get cyber insurance and things like that. 23% uh, said it takes too long for my organization to remediate security incidents. Common problem, security team takes a long time to detect things, have to work with IT operations to remediate things. They don't have common tools. They don't have common case management systems. All of that impacts their ability to react. So there's a lot more data here, and I could spend all the time on this, but um, Stan, I'm sure that this is very, very um, consistent with what you've been seeing. Yeah, it's, you know, just, a, just before we move on to the, just before we move on to the next slide, like your total cost of operations, um, you know, security is, as I'm sure everybody knows, this isn't going to be a new item, but it really isn't, it's not a profit center. 
which I think a lot of companies before something major happens just don't see a lot of value in in terms of um, you know investing in it. And it is an investment. Uh, you've got to invest in the people. You've got to invest in the tools, and you have to be able to make their lives easier. And, and one thing just compounds another as it as as it goes through. So it, it's you know it's it's almost like a cascading effect if you look at if you look at your research here because it's just going to keep it's just going to keep going you know it's like an avalanche it's just going to gain momentum as it goes downhill you know unless unless certain things are are addressed sort of top down. All right, can we move ahead to the next slide here? So one of the big things in terms of our perspective here uh, at D3 is that a lot of these challenges that, that we saw, we're, we, we really are addressing. We're, we're, we're looking at filling the skills gap. We're looking at really helping out in, in different areas of SOC that, that we're able to in, in terms of the reporting gaps, the resource gaps, and, and of course, the skills gaps as they move through. Um, a couple of good points to, to look at in terms of when, when evaluating like a SOAR tool. Um, you know, for example, like our, our data hub um, in, in our back end is able to easily ingest lots of different types of information from, from, different, uh, from different sources. Certain things that we look at, uh, threat intelligence uh, enrichment, you know, in terms of what type of an incident, when, when it comes in, you know, are your, are your analysts having to head through a whole bunch of different tools and, and manually bring in, um, you know, extra, extra contextualized uh, information, um, whether it's on IP addresses, whether it's on domains, whether it's on, uh, you know, file hashes or anything else on there. Uh, this is the type of information where we're looking at um, automating these type of processes. So the analysts can, you know, grab, have this information come in immediately when an alert is, uh, is, is, is pushed into, into, into our system. Again, saving that kind of time. Because if you're running around trying to go and find all this information, you're, you're spending valuable time gathering it rather than just simply analyzing what should be coming in in an automated fashion into the platform. Um, it, you know, the research talks about like you know, new applications, new users, difficulty in scaling, and these are all things that you know, um, you know, properly implemented SOAR solution really should be helping you out with. Um, you know, out of the box, there should be a number of integrations that are bi-directional. Uh, to be able to in, pass information back and forth, whether you're talking about a threat intelligence platform that, you know, maybe you've looked up something and it isn't and within, your, within uh, your threat intelligence platform, you should be able to update that platform back to that particular vendor and, and be able to, to do that. And, and it's one of, the, one of the strengths from the D3 system is that we have these type of bi-directional integrations. You know, finally, John, just in terms of these re your research is the time pressure that you brought up. Um, there just isn't enough time for strategizing and, and, and process improvement because, as you said, they're just they're too in the weeds. They're too firefighting. Um, they can't get their heads up to actually, you know, get that eagle point of view in terms of okay, where do we need to adjust our processes? Where can we strategize differently? What's really happening across the threat landscape um, that we can go from a top view to make our lives easier? Um, and that's again, that's that's probably where the best part of the you know of the automation orchestration comes in is just really driving those instant response times down to help them get out of the weeds. And uh, that's, that's really what we're looking for here at, uh, at D3. Go ahead and move to the next slide, please, Alex. So again, these are some of the, some of the points here. Um, John, do you have anything like in terms of what you've seen here in in the marketplace, especially in SOAR, because you've done a lot of research in this area? Um, anything else that you've noticed? Anything that um, that sort of really stuck out with you in terms of in terms of these items? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, really, what this slide calls into Stan is just this is the aggregate situation. There's an increasing uh, your security team has an increasing workload. There's only so much people can do and do well. Uh, that's exact, problems around that are exacerbated by too many manual processes. So what I do have to do, uh, I have to get other people involved or I have to do things myself. Um, there are too many tools. And um, I either am short-staffed or I don't have the right skills or both. And I'd say the other thing to your point, Stan, is that um, a lot of times what we've done in the past is we've, uh, we've kind of allocated or, or delegated a lot of the security 
uh, analytics and incident response to superstars on the team who have built their own methodologies, who use their own tools. Uh, they call it tribal knowledge a lot of times. And that worked in the past, but it doesn't work anymore for a couple of reasons. Number one, it just doesn't scale. So if we have more incidents coming in, more alerts, uh, we have various types of threats coming in, um, we can all, people can only do so much so it doesn't scale. And probably even more concerning to me than that, Stan, is that uh, the security uh, hiring market, the, 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 the security skills shortage, in fact, has created a, a seller's market. So I'm a, I'm a very strong cybersecurity analyst. Uh, I'm probably getting calls all the time. In fact, um, the research we did with ISSA last year indicated 49% of cybersecurity professionals are solicited to take another job at least once a week. Wow. So if your intellectual knowledge, if your if your uh, basically your tribal knowledge actually walks out the door and you don't have formal processes and you don't have run books and you don't have end-to-end -end case management systems, um, you're in a lot of trouble. And so I'd say that's sort of my observation on uh, just in, in addition to the data, uh, there's some emotional and um, people-oriented things going on that, that really make these issues much more important. All right. Can we go ahead and uh, forward the slides here now? Yeah, this is one of mine, too, and uh, I, I really... It, <laughs> So, um, if you if you've ever seen a picture of me, my wife says I'm starting to look like Albert Einstein. Yeah. But um, there's a quote attributed to, to, to Albert Einstein. There's some argument as to whether he actually said this, but I think the quote is apropos here. Mm -hmm. um, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So all the manual processes and uh, and lack of people and point tools that isn't working. Um, but simple automation and looking at the symptoms of a problem versus the problem itself, that will only get you so far. So I think we really do have to take a much broader look at what we're doing here and come up with a different approach. Stan, is that, that's probably what you guys see because that's the business it, you're in. That's exactly what we see um, you know, over and over again. And uh, you know, whether, whether Einstein said this or not, it's, uh, you know what, life proves this over and over again. Um, you know what, it, it is insane if we think that we can keep doing the same thing over and over again without actually backing up, taking a good overview as to what we're looking at and, and changing things because it isn't going to change, right? We, we, we see that, we know that from real life, that uh, doing the same things, you're going to get the same results. I, I love this quote, by the way. Yeah, I think, and again, it's just so appropriate for what we're discussing. So if you go on to the next slide, Here's some good news, but it's not surprising news. When we asked our security uh, panel, and it was 412 security and IT specialists, but uh, the IT specialists had a role in security analytics and operations. We asked them, will your organization increase its spending on security analytics and operations in the future? And you can see that 33% uh, said that their organization would increase spending significantly and 48% said that they would increase spending somewhat. Now, there's some good news there. You could say, well, people understand that there's a problem and they're addressing it with investment. But the bad news is that the problem is so acute that there's this need to spend a lot more money. So we, we obviously believe that there's a lot more work to do in this space. And um, as we saw before, Stan, um, if one of the problems, or, or if it's, excuse me, the top challenge was uh, the cost of operations, then we have to spend our money wisely to get return on investment so that we can decrease the cost of operations so we make our operations more efficient. So the thought of just buying more and more point tools just isn't appropriate here. And so I'm a little, while it's, it's sort of a good news, bad news scenario of good news is we're, we're willing to spend more, the bad news is, hopefully, we're not throwing good money after bad. Yeah, and to that to that point, John, I, I agree with you 110. Um, you know, we can. 
I mean, there's countless uh, examples over the last couple of years, especially where you know something something bad has happened, a terrible data breach, and then you know there's immediately millions spent. Um, but it's it's good to see that they're spending. But as you said, it needs to be wise spending. Um, one of the you know one of the things we look at is um, you know security teams are growing, but with you know, and this is again a compounding problem. How many people, you know, how many of the analysts coming out, um, you know, are going to be straight out of school, right? How many of these are going to have, you know, little to no experience? And and that's not uh, that, that's not a bad thing. Um, but the issue then becomes, um, you know, you've got a company's going to have to be willing to invest in these people. They're going to have to be willing to spend the money, invest, and keep them. Um, you know, as you said, without having the intellectual property walk out the door when when they are trained up. Um, you know, and onboarding is a big thing, um, and because of the way that our platform handles the ability to to orchestrate in these areas, onboarding can be can be easier. Um, you know, we give a consistent methodology for for people to use, and and it doesn't have to be a different methodology than what they're currently using, but the platform inherently allows a consistency and and a way for junior analysts to be onboarded much 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 quicker. Uh, and you know, on the automation portion of it, you know, if you've got that sort of star player in your field already, um, the platform should be able to house at least you know a good portion of their intellectual um, property that they've done for the company, right? So that if they do walk out on a better job, you know, the sock isn't left there going, well, what are we going to do now, right? You, you have right. to have some way of, of housing that property in there that that other junior analysts can use. You know, so that somebody isn't you know hand holding them, but at the same time that you're not losing you know losing out on the, on that valuable skill set that may be walking out the door. Um, it's it's something that we've that we've really tried to address, um, and we've done a good job of addressing it. Uh, and it's probably one of the biggest feedbacks that, that we end up getting. So yeah, it's it's great to see their spending. Let's again, let's hope that it's it's a wise spending is is a big thing here. Yeah, and Stan, you brought up some good points. I really go with the the next slide. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, there are, along with increased budgets, there are plans to hire more security analysts, security operators, incident responders. So in the blue pie piece, uh, those people, 28% have uh, planned to increase headcount by 25%. 34% uh, wanted to or said yes, they will uh, increase headcount by between 10 and 24 percent, et cetera. Only 19 percent of those we surveyed said they don't have any plans to increase headcount. Here's the problem, is there are way more jobs than people. I mean, millions of more jobs, cybersecurity jobs, than people. And um, there's some issues around that. So if you're a smaller company, you're less likely to be able to hire than a larger company. Even if and I'm thinking compensation is, is uh, a wash. Um, but smaller companies have fewer resources, and larger companies have more benefits and, uh, and some attractive things that cybersecurity professionals look for. If you're in a rural area, much more difficult to hire. If you're in the public sector, much more difficult to hire. Uh, so we do have to have strategies. And in fact, one of the things I say to CISOs is, Assume that you won't have enough people in every decision that you make. So what do we do? We have to automate. We have to orchestrate. We have to let technology do a lot of work for us. That's what we're here to talk about is how to do that in a security operations context. So Stan, this really dovetails to exactly what you just said. Yeah, and it's, I mean, that's, it's, it's one of the, again, it's one of the struggles that we see with, with um, pretty much everyone across the board. Uh, it's, it's not, it's yeah. not going to be a new problem. Um, and you, you're right. I mean, you know, it's, it's one of the things where, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, if I look back, like, you know, D3 is based out of, out of Vancouver, British Columbia. The numbers, according to Canadian statistics, I think by 2019, we were, I think there's going to be, and we're obviously a much smaller uh, population count than, than the U.S., but you're looking at like 100, and, I think there was about 150,000 unfillable positions by 2019, and I think the numbers for the U.S. were, were even greater. Um, yeah. So it's, a, it, it's, it's good to see they're going to be increasing, but uh, the, the gap there is just, is just huge. Right, and and my data says we're not catching up, so you do have to plan yep. accordingly. Absolutely. And if you go to the next slide, um, 
here's what we're here to talk about is SOAR or automation and orchestration. Uh, it's been about two or three years that I've been following this and it came out of some open source projects but now uh, and some kind of roll your own type things, scripting, um, software, uh, again open source but what we're seeing now is pretty broad adoption of security uh, operations automation and orchestration technology. So this represents this. So in the blue, 19% of those we surveyed said that their organization was already adopting security uh, automation and orchestration technology extensively. In yellow, 39% said their organization was doing this on a limited basis. In green, 26% said the organization's currently engaged in a project to automate and orchestrate security analytics and operations. And then other organizations have uh, interest in doing so. So there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of projects going on. It's, there's a, a heavy kicking of the tires phase. Um, but there's also a lot of confusion. What do you do? When do you do it? What's important? What's not important? How do you get incremental value as you deploy these technologies and use them more extensively? And uh, clearly, that's, that's an area that D3 has hands-on experience. And so, Stan, I know that that's what you'll be talking about, but care to comment on this particular slide? Yeah, it's, you know, you're right. I mean, it, it's like, you know, you've been, you've been writing on it for, for a good while now. Automation orchestration in terms of the market itself, um, you know, I think, and this is, you know, you touched on the fact that it seems to be some confusion in the market too, and it's it, it's because it's so new. I mean, you know, how long how long has the market been around for? Like two years, three years, roughly. Um, you know, and it's yeah. It, yeah, and it's you know, it's it's an evolvement of of the other areas where you know because the skills gap, because of you know lack of resourcing and and the number of the sheer number of tools out there. Um, the ability to amalgamate and then automate and orchestrate these type of these type of items is, is on the forefront, and it, it's, I think it's going to remain on the forefront for a good number of years yet. Um, you know, there's no security silver bullet, right? Um, we we have to be able to adapt with what we have, and uh, and that's where the automation orchestration comes in is to really go and address address these type of things, and and you know what? Hopefully, we can go and demystify some of that uh, through through this webinar. Yeah, I think that that's certainly our objective, and hopefully that you're right, we do that. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, so if that's what people are doing, if they're adopting this technology, the obvious question here is, what are you, why are you adopting this? What are you trying to do? So uh, if you go to the next slide, the automation and orchestration priorities we found in the research. So 35% said integrating external threat intelligence with internal security data collection and analysis. So you might have different teams. You certainly in the past have had different tools, or you didn't have any tools for threat intelligence. You were just getting raw feeds. But those two data sources are always used together. Are there ways that we can use automation and orchestration tools to give us an advantage on those investigations, to merge that data, to contextualize or curate that data. And that's what organizations want to do with these kinds of tools. 30% uh, said they want to add custom functionality that sits above their existing security tools. Well, what does that mean? Think of run books uh, where I take the output from one, day, one tool and that leads me to the output from another tool uh, which leads me to some steps and some communication between groups. So a lot of the case management type of capabilities uh, or the, like I say, the process and the workflow capabilities, I can put, I can use these tools to actually automate some of those or at least systematize them so that we're doing when there's a, a phishing uh, investigation or when, when we see a, um, a system beaconing out to a command and control server, we have a consistent process to proceed and consistent people who will input into that process every time. We're not making this up. We're not depending on tribal knowledge. 29% um, said they wanted to automate basic remediation tasks. We get some type of IOC that should kick off a firewall rule or an antivirus rule or a DNS rule or something that blocks that access to that uh, 
that file or that URL or that domain or that IP address in the future. But too often, those actions are still manual. And if I can use automation to take the humans out of this, all the better. So these are some of the use cases, Stan. I'm sure you have a million more that you'll talk about. But um, seems like a good list to start, don't you think? I, you know what, I think it's a great list to start. Um, you know, this, this, is, this is where when we talked about earlier, like the integration side of it is becoming so important. Um, you know, a lot of disparate tools, a lot of jumping around and running around, whereas, you know, we have a lot of tools that do a lot of good things. Um, and it's a matter of getting them to work together in a way that's going to be efficient and in a way that's going to um, provide certain things. Because you look at, like, um, you know, basic, you know, remediation items. Um, you know, firewalls, for example, have come a long way. Right? The interfaces have come a long way. The ability now, um, a number of companies have, you know, now APIs where you can actually, you know, automate a lot of those functions. Those are the type of tools that need to be um, integrated into, into, the, uh, into the SOAR platforms. Right? And that's happening more and more. Um, you, know, you don't need an analyst looking at something you know, and then having to manually log into another system, manually going up the rules and all these things. These are the type of basic functions, I think, that um, at least that we hear over and over again that need to be, need to be set. Um, one of the areas here, and, and um, at least we've, we've noticed it as well, is, is the fact of um, disparate security silos within, within organizations um, where you know, the SOC might have access to something but doesn't have access to, you know, what the NOC team has um, and vice versa. And then IT has to take care of, you know, another portion of it. And, and these, the, these are more of the, the solid walls that need to be broken down, at least in my opinion, from, from what we've seen, need to be broken down across enterprises to, to allow, you know what, if this comes in, how about we automate this process across the board so that we're making all the teams more efficient rather than just, you know, passing it from one team to another team to another team where all of a sudden, you know, you're talking, you know, you're talking hours or days before something gets updated and changed, rather than having it done within seconds through this type of automation or orchestration on the side of things. And this is what we're seeing on our client side, especially um, the amalgamation of threat intelligence into the into the platform and that automated decision making process happening. Yeah, it's um, you know, looking at this particular slide here again, you know. You know, invest wisely in the in, in the automation, right? Taking a look at at things that your that your automation your sole product should really be looking at, right? Do they you know do they offer you know certified integrations with with your key systems? Um, and, and maybe as a point of this, because we um, John, I don't know if you know, if you notice this maybe at at our say this year and other places, the word integration gets gets tossed around a lot. And uh, what we've discovered is that that talking to clients and talking to people that are coming to us. There's different types of integrations as well. I'm just going to touch on this briefly, but um, anything from like an automation, like a like an API to API, which is more of a back-end automation type deal, rather than um, or like the Python libraries that you're going to that that people hear about all the time, which is which is a script to an API. So you know, looking at the type of integrations, you know, is it is it bidirectional? Um, what's out of the box? Um, you know, do they have a proper scripting tool? And if they do, how flexible is that is that scripting tool? Um, can you, you know, you know, can you input your own scripts and have input validation and, and be able to set those things up? If you have a star player that, you know, has that ability. If if you don't, is the scripting library robust enough that it's got a that it really has a layer of separation there, so you don't have to have an expert, but you can, you know, set things up, make sure that, uh, you know, m make sure that your the tools are are able to be integrated quickly. But it's a drag and drop situation where you can, you know, once once that area is set up, they can drag and drop it into into various workflows. Um, so these are areas where you know we really look at it. And then probably a big thing that that we really discovered is that you really have to have a robust audit trail. Are you be, are you able to track what's happening? How many actions are happening within the platform? But what's happening on the analysis side? Are you tracking what your analysts are doing? Are you tracking how they're analyzing things? Um, you know, because oftentimes we're dealing with, um, you know, particular clients right now, uh, their compliance team is getting involved with a lot of things. You know, show us what you're doing in your security operations centers, um, because if you're, if you're taking care of the security side of it, in my opinion, the compliance side is going to fall into line fairly quickly too. Um, and we're having compliance teams reach out to the SOCs going, we need, you know, 
X, Y data or these metrics to go and show that, yeah, we are in compliance with, with what we need to be in compliance with. So that's, that's a lot of what we're looking, of what we're seeing within, within the industry itself. Um, can you move ahead to the, to the next slide? So, um, you know, the truth is, you know, automation and, and, and orchestration, um, they really go hand in hand. Uh, you can orchestrate uh, without having automation, but I mean, it's it, it's not quite as good. But the automation really does live within within that orchestration uh, platform. Um, and again, you know, do you have the ability to set up workflows and, and, and playbooks like this on the fly? Can you implement your own as you go, or, or you know, are you stuck? Uh, these are type of things that you really want to you really want to look at. And, and you know, it is it is wisely investing, right? Look at the or look at the orchestration platform. What do they supply for you? Um, you know, and, and really dig down into that. Take take your time on that particular area. Alex, can you go ahead and move one more slide forward, please? So again, just in this particular area, um, you know, what type of management features do you have? How much of an insight are you getting into your into your um, into the incidences that are happening? All right? Uh, you know, do you have the ability to do link analysis? Do you have the ability to you know, tie into other departments. Um, and maybe I'll just talk a little bit about that real quickly. Like, if, if you're still in a siloed area, does, does your platform have the ability to link out to, you know, other type of ticketing tools? Do you, do you have the ability to, to send things very quickly to other departments uh, so that you still, even if you don't have full control, the orchestration of your tool can help you, um, you know, can help that inter, inter, intercommunication between different solutions? Uh, these are all things that really, really need to be looked at in terms of a wise decision. Uh, can you please move forward? Um, this particular one here, you know, it, this is really how it all comes together. I mean, you have your different sources that, that come in, and, you know, you really should have automation, you know, doing a lot of the triaging for you. Um, if it's coming into a platform, you know, are you bringing in that contextual data that we talked about? Are you able to reach out to your intelligence tools and have them you know, pre-fill that data into the platform for you so that your analyst at a glance gets an overall idea as to what's happening. Um, you know, there's still going to be investigation sides that, that are going to have to happen, but, you know, the more information that we can go and supply analysts right off the top, um, the faster they're going to be able to do their job uh, and, and the better that they're going to be able to do their job because they're going to have a more holistic viewpoint over everything that's happening within, within the situation. And then moving beyond that, you know, can you track the root causes within, within it, right? If you're remediating, remediating the same thing over and over and over again, um, th there's an issue within the environment um, because you really should be getting something, remediating it, looking at the root cause and going, okay, how can we then stop this now from happening, you know, on a, on a, on a consistent basis? And, and that's something where we, you know, we at D3 are really, are, are really trying to help with and, and really uh, focusing on. Go ahead and move on one more slide forward. And then just really understanding the marketplace. Um, you know, take a look at the various tools. Look what they offer you. Um, this is where, you know, some vendors will supply one thing. Some of vendors will, will apply, you know, other things. Um, you know, we really, we really take it seriously that, um, you know, we, we want people to do a really competitive intel on, on their SOAR platforms and what they really need. And this, again, um, you know, John, this kind of goes back even to what you were talking about in terms of, like, the strategizing portion of it. How... Are they getting, you know, if you step back and you can strategize, um, getting an overall viewpoint of what you really need rather than just kind of doing Band-Aid patches along the way, um, being able to back up, take a really good viewpoint of what, you're, what the teams need as a whole, and then going through and, and looking at what's available in the marketplace is, is, is really, really important. And it's something that, uh, you know, we encourage people to do it, um, you know, and, and which is why, you know, we, we offer a number, number of different, different areas of those solutions within, within the D3 platform. Alex, can you move, right, move ahead again? And John, I think this is probably a, a, a good point here for you to take over, like just in terms of the evolution side of things, the SOAR from, from what you've seen. Can you go ahead and talk, talk to that uh, with us? Sure. So there's an evolution from basic SOAR capability, basic automation, which we used to do through scripting, um, to a platform, to a security operations platform or something that fits into what we call SOPA at ESG, Security Operations and Analytics Platform Architecture. Um, some of the things that we're seeing in this evolution is, number one, security operations-centric case management. 
Now we have IT case management and ticketing systems, but they're really not designed for the life cycle of security incidents. So we need those types of tools, and that's really becoming part of SOAR, is life cycle management and visibility communications, IT operate. So really a shared platform with a common data set and common functionality so we can track and take action on incidents across their life cycle from onset to closure. Advanced automation, so really integrating with standard operating procedures and um, really understanding what those procedures are, basing them on best practices, basing them on uh, standard practices like NIST uh, 800 series type of practices, and a lot of that built into the platform itself. So process automation across uh, heterogeneous tools or process orchestration, excuse me. So if I know uh, a certain process has to connect with multiple tools to either in, to get data for investigations or to take some type of remediation action, I want to be able to orchestrate that from, again, from start to finish. And so we need uh, the things that are listed here. We need APIs and open platforms. We need development support. Vendors working together on connectors, so there's out-of-box functionality. This isn't all custom. And then we talked about the use case of looking at internal data and comparing that to what's going on in the wild with threat intelligence. That's got to be built again into the system so that that very, very common use case is accounted for and supported and, in fact, uh, enhanced with best practices. And then analyst-centric enhancements, this is something, Stan, I'm sure you can talk about with all your experience, but um, this isn't technology for technology's sake. Uh, my friend Bruce Schneier says that security is a process, not a product. Security operations is absolutely a process. And so we can learn from what analysts do. We can watch what analysts' behavior is. And when we spot a best practice, we can capture that. And then we can share that amongst either a customer base or code it into the products themselves. So that's really what I'm suggesting here as the evolution of SOAR is really understanding how people are using the technology and then give them the opportunity to uh, take to marry the, the technology itself to the best practices. Yeah, absolutely. This, you know, I, I'll agree with you 110% on that one because um, ultimately, you know, while we can get machines to do a lot of things right now, the people side of it, is, is, is still where the real brain work is. And uh, again, we've learned, I mean, we've learned a lot from our clients in terms of differences that we've uh, implemented into our own platform. But, you know, I'm in, I, I'm in pretty much constant contact with, with a lot of the clients that, that, uh, that we have and a lot of them that I work with specifically. And, and it just becomes over and over again. It, it's, um, I, I don't think I've seen a single um, process, uh, so to speak, um, that, that sort of stays stagnant overly, overly long. Um, we, worked with, uh, we worked with one uh, large financial sector client a little while back, and uh, they, went through their, they went through the implementation, they had their workflows, they had their, and, and they, they are using a NIST 800-based uh, framework for all of their processes. But, I mean, I think, if, if I'm correct, they had, they had a bunch of their processes up, up and changed within three weeks of using the platform, uh, simply because of the fact that they, they started noting, noticing inefficiencies um, with what they were, you know, with what the framework was telling them and what their analysts were actually doing. And, and they managed to incorporate that and just, you know, basically, you know, help their processes, you know, via what their people were doing. So it, it, that's a big thing. Um, Analyst-centric enhancements is, you know, is a must. You have to be able to incorporate those, incorporate those into the platform. Yes, and experience matters there. So the, the fact that you guys have the, the long history and the pedigree is very important. Absolutely. I think we can move to the move to the next slide. I think we'll uh, we'll we'll end it off with uh, there. Um, we've got uh, John. We've got a few minutes left. Are we comfortable taking? Uh, there should be some questions that. Uh, 
that uh, from the audience. If there's anything uh, open-ended right now, we'd love to hear some. Um, Alex, do we have any? Uh, do we have any coming in? Yeah, great presentation, guys. It was uh, quite informative here. We've got a few questions actually pouring in, and uh, the first question I think that's probably for Stan or probably John could answer this. Are sort type solutions mostly on SaaS, on premise, or on a hybrid hosting module? Hmm. I, I know ours, but John, what have what have you seen sort of in the marketplace in in terms of what you've noticed? Because I'll talk to our platform, but but I would love to hear what uh, what what you've noticed in that in that regard. Uh, so the form factors come in all of the above, and um, I mean, I'd say the majority of companies that I've seen have done have used an on-premise model. But I think as you go down market and as you go to um, maybe some organizations in uh, non-regulated industries, they may be comfortable with a SaaS model. It's a it's a question of trade-offs. I mean, there's um, a SaaS model. There's less control if you're concerned about regulated data or data privacy. Um, you opt for an on-premise option. Uh, if you don't have as many employees, if you're looking to lower the cost of IT infrastructure, you may go with a SaaS model. So um, I've seen all of it. Uh, I'd say early on, it's mostly on-premise, but um, we'll see. We'll see how it evolves. Yeah, I know, I know from our perspective on that one, um, like we offer both. Uh, but it's interesting, interesting to see there's not really one specific, I would say, vertical that is that's sort of leaning to one or, one or the other. Um, from, from my experience so far, it's been more of a risk appetite item. Um, some, are, some are just fine going to the cloud, and, and others just don't want to adopt it yet uh, due to the risk appetite, and they would rather go with an on-premise. So that's, that's sort of been my, my perspective from what I've seen from, from various, uh, various clients that, that I've dealt with. Great, thanks for your answer. Uh, we see another question here. What security events are the most common use cases for a high level of automation? Why don't you take that one, Stan? Mm. Alex, can you repeat that one one more, one more time? Uh, I'll read it, read it again here. What security thanks. events are the most common use cases for a high level of automation? Uh, let's see. So the ones that I've seen in terms of uh, the automation portion size of it, um, one I think would be, well, phishing tends to be the number one attack vector right now. In terms of automating that particular process, uh, oftentimes, so I'll give you the use case that I've seen. Uh, it's probably the best way for me to answer this. So oftentimes, most enterprises will have uh, their own people report phishing um, if they catch it, obviously. Um, but they'll report it into a specific uh, security inbox. And from that point, um, the platform, at least our platform, and I know others, you know, this is something maybe to look into, but our platform basically uh, will sync with that particular inbox, intake it, and then, uh, and then basically um, it, it automates the process from there. So once it comes into the platform through that integration with either like an Exchange or a Gmail integration, um, that's where the automation then takes over. Because once it's into the platform, that's where you can parse the data out. That's where you can, you know, look at the various, various points and then, you know, amalgamate them with your threat, threat intelligence. That's sort of been the biggest use case that I've seen in terms of uh, an automation process. Um, John, is there any particular yeah. use case that, that you may have seen? Yeah, I mentioned the one of um, taking uh, IOCs with a high degree of confidence or a high risk score and automating blocking rules, whether that's at the firewall, IDS, IPS, uh, endpoints within a proxy. Um, that's, a, that's a common use case. Um, automating certain investigation behavior, so uh, I get an alert from a network security analytics tool that says that uh, Stan's workstation is communicating to a known command and control server. Um, automate the, the, the gathering of um, endpoint data, um, looking for events, um, looking for a process that's actually generating that traffic. What's that process related to? Was it related with file download? And then pivoting over to, um, well, have we seen that IOC or that behavior in other systems? So a lot of those kinds of linkages for, um, for investigations is, is fairly, fairly common. Mm -hmm. yeah, good one. Um, Alex, I'm just going to grab, there was a question from the audience here just in regards to, to pricing model. I'm not going to get into pricing just here on, on the webinar, but um, 
uh, for the person that asked that question, if you could just uh, please re reach out to the contact and, uh, and, and we can go through that for you. So the actual question was, uh, do you have any pricing models that would provide lower costs for nonprofits? Um, you know what? Please reach out to us on that. And uh, that's something that we can that we can take yeah, offline. Yeah, we'll make sure um, one of our account reps reaches out to you and answers that question in detail. Um, so we have, we have time for one last question for the audience, and uh, I'm going to choose this one here. Uh, what steps can we take to get ready for implementing orchestration platforms? Mm. John, you want to tackle that one first? Yeah, I, I'd say that the the best. The two things I've observed are, number one, um, choose a process to orchestrate that you're very comfortable with, that you feel like uh, doesn't need a lot of process improvement. So something that works well, but it's inefficient because of all the manual steps. Uh, that's probably where you start. And then beyond that, assess your processes first, because um, you don't want to automate or orchestrate a broken process. So have start with confidence in the process, and then move on to automation and orchestration. Uh, if there's any friction in the process, if there is, if it could be more efficient before you automate and orchestrate it, look into that. Yeah, you know what? I'll agree with you 110 percent on that one. Um, that was probably one of the biggest things we got uh, at RSA while we were there. Was um, is there still a point? So even if you automate um, a process, is there, is there a way to do it like a partial automation? In other words. Can I have a point where the the analyst still has a review and has the ability to click the button to then you know automate the rest of the, the rest of the process or the the, the manual um, the manual portion of you know either a either a block or something else like that? Um, and I you know what I'll piggyback with you I'll, I'll piggyback on that one with you because it's uh, th that I think is probably the number one thing to look at in terms of in terms of that area. Um, yeah, I, I think we're we're at the top of the hour. Um, mm -hmm. Alex, I'll go ahead and let you uh, let, let you take it over from here. Sure. Well, uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, taking the time to join our webinar. Thank you, John. Thank you, Stan. And as always, we're always uh, happy to answer any any other questions. So you can reach out to our uh, email address, and we'll make sure our uh, sales reps are um, keep their ears open for your questions. And we'll also be sending the webinar recording to all those who registered, as well as, as those who registered and attended. So you can share it with your colleagues, share it with someone else at your office. And um, yeah, thanks, everyone. And I uh, wish everyone has a great day. Uh, thanks, guys. And we'll leave it there. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.